Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Born on the south side of Chicago, Glenn Cartman Lowry became a tenured professor of economics at Harvard at the age of 33. Four decades later, Dr. Lowry holds a chair in social sciences and economics at Brown. Dr. Lowry also hosts a weekly podcast on the Ricochet Network, The Glenn Show. Professor Lowry, thank you. My pleasure. On The Glenn Show, you call yourself a woke buster. And now, what I want to know is what a chaired prof you this is really quite an august thing. You have a you, you are a chaired professor at one of the nation's oldest and most prestigious universities. What are you doing calling yourself a woke buster? Well, if the other side, so to speak, that is the woke side, weren't so crazy, I could go on, a, you know, with my equations and my lectures and mind my own business. I'm trying to stay in touch with reality and maybe save the country. Maybe save the country. All right. Modest <laughs> ambitions. All right. You're a man who has traveled great distances. One of these journeys, for want of a better term, is socioeconomic. You grow up in a rough neighborhood in Chicago. You become a father while you're still in your teens. You take a job as a clerk in a printing plant. And that's where you start. Here's yeah. where you go. Doctorate at MIT by age 27. MIT is not a place, easy place to get through. Tenured professor of economics by 33, chaired professor at Brown. We could devote the whole show to your life story. What, what, do you, what would you want people to know about how Glenn Lowry made that particular journey? How did Glenn Lowry get from here on the south side of Chicago to a chaired professorship in Providence, Rhode Island? Well, it's a long story, Peter. I don't think we have all day. Um, I got a lot of help. I got inspiration from my father, very good man, no longer with us, um, self-made man who labored hard all of his life and uh, rose to a high level in the Internal Revenue Service as a federal employee. Um, I got a wonderful support from teachers. I was fortunate enough at Northwestern University to have been recruited as a scholarship student uh, even though I was married with kids and working a full-time job. But they were looking for some promising prospects from the south side of Chicago to bring in the Northwestern in the early 1970s. And gosh, I discovered the whole world, intellectually speaking, at that university in the few years that I spent there. Uh, tremendous inspirational teachers at MIT, a great economics department now, but even a greater department then, with Nobel laureates to spare. Um, and, you know, God-given talent, if I may say so, that allowed me to take advantage of these opportunities. I worked my tail off. I kept my nose to the grindstone finally, even though I bounced around a little bit in my teens. And uh, it has paid off. Hmm. All right. You, you, you grant that you work hard, but only after expressing gratitude three or four times in a row did you come to how hard you worked. That's, I, I, I'll come back to that. That, that, that strikes me as a kind of fundamental piece of your outlook about life, Glenn, but we'll come back to that. A lecture you deliver, delivered in Richmond, 2005, you discussed the 1968 Kerner Commission, which issued a report on the riots during the long summer of 1967. The commission, as you note, blamed the riots on racism, failed social programs, and a lack of economic opportunity. And this is what Glenn Lowry said in 2005, speaking in Richmond's. To a significant extent, the Kerner Commission's recommendations were heeded. There is not one significant institution in American political or economic life which has been unaffected by the push for diversity and the emphasis on multiculturalism, which now dominate discussions of race relations. Blacks wield vastly more political clout at all levels of government today than was the case four decades ago. Yet it is arguable that conditions are worse. The prisons of the nation overflow with young black men. Two thirds of black babies are born to unwed mothers nationwide." Close quote. Why? What went wrong? The Kerner Commission said reasonable things. The country responded. And you say it is arguable that conditions are worse. It's a hard question that you're asking, I think, Peter. 
um, I think the vision, the vision of the anointed, as our friend Thomas Sowell would say, the a vision that we could solve this problem by uh, expanding the great society, by enacting more anti-discrimination laws, by doubling down on affirmative action, uh, and so forth, was is in error. This problem is a development problem. This is the way that I would put it now, not a bias problem. This is a, a issue of empowering and uh, um, envisioning um, a uh, confrontation with the consequences of our history that have left the African-American population, large swaths of it, not performing in ways that allow us to take advantage of the opportunities that have been created. Um, as my friend Shelby Steele is fond of saying, the problem before us now is not a problem of oppression. It's a problem of freedom. It's a problem of seizing opportunity. It's a problem of taking responsibility. I mean, let's just look at some of those statistics. Mm -hmm. Outsized rates of criminal uh, participation, of violence, of um, of uh, the kinds of in uncivil behavior that get you locked up in prison. That's why the jails are overflowing with African Americans, not because there's a conspiracy in the state legislature or in the several police departments to go around locking up black people, but because too many of our youngsters, of our young men, are behaving in ways that end up leaving them in confrontation with the law and leaving them uh, susceptible to imprisonment in education. The uh, skills development gap is reflected in test scores or the representation of African-Americans in certain elite educational venues, the kind of circumstance that people want to invoke affirmative action to uh, repair, are to a large uh, extent a result of the failure of public institutions of educational service delivery to uh, deliver for their clients, but also a reflection of the patterns of behavior, of the allocation of time, of values, of communal norms, of the uh, extent of parenting, of the uh, uh, emphasis on developing the intellectual potential of, uh, of our population. Uh, look at the family. You say two thirds of kids born to women who are not married, you should look at the abortion rate amongst African-Americans, it's stratospheric. Um, the uh, gender relations between men and women, which is the central uh, focus of how it is that societies reproduce themselves in a healthy fashion, is deeply, deeply troubled. So, whereas in 1968, it was a compelling argument to say two nations separate and unequal, that's what the Kerner Commission said, white America must own up to its responsibilities. In 1968, that could have uh, made a lot of sense. In the year 2021, the ball is in our court. I speak now about African-Americans. This is basically a level playing field that we are dealing with right here. In the freest, most prosperous, most dynamic society on the planet that millions of people are willing to risk everything just to get into. We are birthright citizens here. The ball is in our court. Glenn, could I let me take you through events of the last couple of years? Honestly, I just made notes on events I'd like to hear you talk about. I just want to know how Glenn Lowry thinks about certain events. Okay. Two quotations. Here's the first one from the We Believe page of the website for Black Lives Matter. Quote, the impetus for our commitment was and still is the rampant and deliberate violence inflicted on us by the state. Close quote. Here's a, the second quotation. This happens to be from an article in Newsweek about a year ago, but I could have chosen dozens of sources. Here's, here's what Newsweek had. On Sunday, May 30th, 2020, Chanel Hawk's store was one of dozens looted in Atlanta and many more across the U.S. amid days of protests following the death of George Floyd. As a black business owner, black business owner, Hawk said she was shocked to learn looters targeted her store at a time when protesters were taking to the streets to call on the government to address systematic racism, close quote. So what do I know? I'm just a white guy and a layman looking at this and I said, Black Lives Matter, it, it sounds noble in some ways, it sounds aspirational, but the, what is happening in the cities? What, 
just how do you think about that? Well, underlining violence against black people, I think, is hysteria. I think it's wild hyperbole. Uh, I think we have to keep the issue that they're talking about, which is that sometimes police acting badly or outside of their legitimate authority take black life. That does happen. It mm -hmm. has happened in the country. We can tick off the examples. On the other hand, it's a country of 330 million people. There are tens of thousands of arrests that take place every day in this country. We're talking about a handful of incidents that become viral events on social media uh, in which there can be some question about inappropriate behavior by police toward black people. But the metaphor uh, that Al Sharpton invoked at George Floyd's funeral, America, take your knee off of our neck, is fiction. It's a lie. It's not an apt description of the actual circumstance. For a black person to fear going out of their door uh, that the police might somehow uh, reprimand, uh, uh, inappropriately uh, treat them. It's like not going outside because you're afraid of being struck by lightning. Uh, so that's objectively an inaccurate characterization of the circumstance. And if you lay that alongside the actual threats to black life, which are sadly coming from the possibility of violent criminal victimization in the neighborhoods in which they live, often by other black people, uh, the hyperbole, the shtick that they've got going here, the narrative that they are pushing. I'm talking about Black Lives Matter. I'm talking about anti-racist activists who take the unfortunate few incidents of police mistreatment of black people and use it as a general characterization of the circumstances of black people in the country. Um, it, it is uh, uh, something that a woke buster like myself is willing to devote a little bit of time uh, debunking. Glenn, I, I, Chicago. Again, I just I just throw things up to you to see how you think about them. But the, what, Chicago during the last twelve months, seven hundred and ninety people have been killed. Six hundred and twenty-six of them, almost eighty percent, were black. Shouldn't I mean? There's isn't there an argument that, and, and this is a, a, a city where the uh, superintendent of police is African American. Yeah. Um, and the mayor. I, and the mayor. I checked the statistics that about 30% of the city is African American, and only about 20% of the police force, but the superintendent of police is African. Anyway, it just, I think to myself, why aren't there protests calling for more police? These, those neighborhoods. Not only, no. not only calling for more police and making public safety of black people in that city a primary issue, but condemning relentlessly the despicable behavior of a few people, which is making that city so unsafe for everybody else. Instead, too often, we find intellectuals and political leaders, some black, some white, all progressive, making excuses, saying there's nothing to see here, turning away from the obvious failures within society that are manifest in this despicable Behavior. I mean, think about it, taking a human life hundreds of times, a not small number of these victims are children. Mm. This is barbarism. This is unacceptable behavior. I don't think I am out of school simply to say, condemn it. We're better than that. We African-Americans, where's the leadership who talk about African-American society saying of this issue, we're better than that. This is not us. This is not what a healthy African-American community would produce. Condemn this behavior. Glenn, once again, that lecture that you gave in Richmond, <clears throat> I'm quoting you. Liberals insist that these problems derive ultimately from the lack of economic opportunities. Conservatives like Charles Murray have argued that the problems are the unintended legacy of a welfare state. If the government would stop underwriting irresponsibly behavior, poor people would be forced to discover self-restraint. And then you write, these polar positions have something very important in common. They both assume that economic factors lie behind the behavioral problems. What are you up to there? On being a Christian and an economist was my subtitle for that lecture. Uh, and what I'm up to is I'm an economist and, you know, we do the things that we do. We have our theories about human behavior. We are uh, basically uh, enamored of the idea that people respond to incentives as they do. And we want to get the prices right as we should. 
Uh, so we have a pretty deterministic and a pretty materialistic outlook on things, left or right. But in those years, I was a better Christian perhaps than I am now. Uh, I was on fire. And it occurred to me, notwithstanding my training at MIT and notwithstanding my positions in the universities that I've worked at, that there's more to human motivation than getting more, than greed, than satisfying want, than maximizing utility, than accumulating wealth. There's also something called right living. There's something called being comfortable with the way in which I am living my life. There is a spiritual dimension. What people believe, what they take to be significant, where they draw meaning in their lives is also a fundamental aspect of human culture and of human civilization. And I simply wanted to give voice to that idea, that everything's not about getting more or about what, you know, Charles Murray, whom I respect as a social scientist, says that uh, the, we had a war on poverty and poverty won. He says this in his book, Losing Ground, reflecting on the inadequate uh, outcomes associated with the great society. He's right about that. He's right that the incentives of the welfare state often were uh, poverty promoting as opposed to poverty allevi alleviating. But that's not all that's going on when I look at two thirds of kids being born to an African-American woman being born to a woman without a husband. That's not all that's going on when I look at the rates of violence that we were just talking about a moment ago. There's space for appealing to people at the level of their spiritual responsibilities and uh, urging them to look differently at how it is that they should live their lives. I say in that essay, what uh, program could be more effective at encouraging parents to take responsibility for their children than persuading them that they're God's stewards in the lives of their children. A clever economist can come up with all kinds of schemes to motivate them financially, but if they embrace that idea that this is a precious responsibility, this is a sacred obligation, they're going to get the job done that we want them to get done. I'm quoting you again, raising the issues of morality and values is vitally important. The family and the church are the natural sources of moral teaching, indeed, the only sources, close quote. Okay. Uh, if we were a tent meeting, I'd have converted now listening to Preacher Lowry. <laughs> this is very moving. And it feels to me right. You're saying true things about human beings. What is the government? What, if you say that it's church and family, those are organic. Either they're there or they're not. I don't know how government puts together, puts the family back together. How, I, I certainly have no idea how any government program can reassert the centrality in African-American life of the black church. So I, I guess what I'm saying is it's powerful and moving and it sounds like the clarion yeah. sound of a trumpet, but there's a sense in which it could let everybody off the hook and say, well, it's the black, it's the black church and the family. And if they're not there, there's really nothing we can do about it. Do you see what I mean? No, I do see what you mean right. because the ability of the state through law and through policy to tell people how to live is limited because we're a pluralistic society. Right. We don't have a state religion. Uh, we don't tell people what to believe at that level. Uh, so therefore, given that what they believe is important to how they function and that the state can't dictate to people what to believe, there's a conclusion there, which is that there's a limit on what the state can achieve in the face of this problem. And that if we really want to see this problem ultimately resolved, we have to encourage the development of institutions from the ground up. Um, we have to, in our rhetoric and in our public leadership, extol the virtue of these institutions. So let me be very concrete. Education. Okay? Big city uh, public school teachers unions basically control the flow of resources to the for the delivery of those services to youngsters. There's nothing written anywhere that says that the only model for educating young people is large public union-driven institutions delivering uh, uh, the services. You could have a thousand flowers blooming, 10,000 flowers blooming, a million flowers blooming, 
They could be charter schools with some public funds going in. They could be parochial schools with a particular religious uh, conviction that they might have. They could be homeschooling. There's a, there could be 20 families getting together and deciding to pool their resources in a way to educate their children. I don't know all the possibilities that lie there. I do know that the entrepreneurial spirit and the convictions that people bring about their responsibilities to their children have unlimited potential. This is what I believe. So there, the government just has to get out of the way. It could, or, or, it could provide or, or some force resources the, force because the people are paying part. taxes, but it would give parents the autonomy to redirect those resources in ways that they saw uh, were best. Glenn, let me quote to you from a column that Tom Sowell, now 91 years old and still swinging, Tom Sowell just wrote a column, published a column this month. Wow. Yes. I should be so lucky. Well, you will be. Or at least there are those of us who are going to get on the phone and say, hey, Lowry, what's an, another book, please. <laughs> a lot of us. <laughs> okay. All right. So here's, here's Tom Sowell, quote, when school propaganda teaches black kids to hate white people, that is a danger to all Americans of every race, low-income minority students especially cannot afford the luxury of having their time wasted on ideological propaganda in the schools when they're not getting a decent education in mathematics or the English language. When they graduate and go on to higher education that could prepare them for professional careers, hating white people is not likely to do them nearly as much good as knowing math and English, close quote. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, he's absolutely right about that. The uh, ideological temper of much of the educational establishment, which wants to uh, spew its propaganda over our children, uh, is a waste of time because we don't really have that uh, luxury to, uh, to indulge given the serious impediments to African-American children's participation in our society that comes about from their failure to get a decent education. But I would go further. We're Americans here, black people, African-Americans. We're 10, 12% of a population of a dynamic, uh, growing, uh, constantly changing country. We need our fellow citizens on side with us on behalf of any program of any worth that we might want to pursue. Hating white people is madness in this country. I mean, it's simply a losing strategy. It is akin to a toddler throwing a tantrum when he doesn't get his way. It gets us nowhere. The intellectuals, the, the people who, I could name names, but I'm, it's not about personalities here, who, who throw this kind of stuff around, Whitey is your enemy, are already living high on the hog of this society. They can afford to alienate their colleagues. But people who are dependent upon basic functioning of social institutions to further their uh, effort at achieving prosperity, those black people, working class black people, lower class black people, uh, people who are just barely holding on, need our fellow Americans on side. Alienating them gratuitously with this racist, and it's racism, this racist rhetoric, hating white people, hating people because of the color of their skin, blaming them for the sins of their fathers or the supposed sins of their fathers. It is not only a waste of time in the schools, it's a, it's, it's a political distraction that we really can't afford. Glenn, let me take you back to your, <clears throat> your day job as professor at Brown. Okay. Last spring, you conducted a seminar at Brown called, quote, Free Inquiry and the Modern World, close quote. And you were kind enough to send me the syllabus and I showed that syllabus to my research assistant, who, by the way, is a recent graduate of Yale, sister school, sister Ivy School of Brown. And my research assistant could hardly believe his eyes. He said, this is the most courageous syllabus I think I have ever seen. So could you just take me? I know the seminar lasted a whole semester at Brown, but I'd like to ask you a few questions. Tell me the significance. Tell me why the items I'm going to mention are on your syllabus. And by the way, seminar, you've described this as a seminar. How many kids were involved? 20. So this is not a lecture class. No. There was this is, a, there's nowhere to hide. You're running a conversation. Sorry. You're calling on kids. They have to participate. Sorry. All right. Um, Socrates' apology, quote, 
and this is, I'm quoting from Socrates, or I'm quoting from Plato's, yeah. you know what I'm quoting Plato's from. Plato's apology of Socrates, yeah. I prophesy to my murderers that after my death, punishment far heavier than you have inflicted on me will surely await you. For the noblest way of life is not to be crushing others, but to be improving yourselves. Close quote. Yeah. What do the kids make of that? They loved it. I should mention David Sachs here, who was my teaching assistant, because this course, he's an undergraduate at Brown. Uh, he's a great concert pianist, and he's also reading Greek and Latin. That's a, he's a classics major at Brown. You know, kids that smart really annoy me, Glenn. I don't and, know, you know. and, you know, he's a contrarian. And he walked into my office one day and he says, you're one of the two or three professors around here I think's got his head on straight. Can I talk to you? Would you mind giving me some time? This is just out of the blue a couple of years ago. He walked into my office. He said, I, I want to break free from the groupthink. Can you help me? So we put together a reading list and we, over the course of a year, did an independent study, just him and me reading some of the works that ended up in this course. Oh, so so st I want, we'll come back to this course. Yeah. I really want to come back to the course. But wait, this kid is reading Greek and Latin. He's a smart kid. He got into Brown. He's reading Greek and Latin. Yeah. He plays the piano. He's smart and he's talented. And I want to break free of groupthink? Yeah. Why is a kid at one of the most elite institutions in the country feel shackled in his mind, intellectually, subjected to group. How can this happen? Now, this was a kid who thought that every Republican politician was not necessarily a fascist. Th this is a kid who thought that capitalism might not really be the road to hell. Um, a kid who thought that while he's Jewish and not especially observant, religious people actually have a place within society. Isn't there something interesting about the fact that people constantly seek meaning in these mythological and, and you know, fanciful systems of belief? He, and, and, what he's getting all around him in the dorm, uh, at the lecture hall, uh, in the classes, the other classes that he's getting is this kind of left of center, secular, uh, ultra woke uh, mantra he's getting. And he knows that it isn't quite right. It certainly doesn't hit his mind as being right. And he's looking for an alternative. And he found out, uh, you know, he followed my podcast a few times. His parents encouraged him because they follow the podcast. Go talk to Lowry. And so he walks into an economist office uh, to say, can you help me, you know, can, can I breathe? I can't breathe around here. Can you help me I can't get some breathe. fresh air? I can't breathe. That's just Anyway, all I want to say is the course that uh, you're referring to came about after that year of reading with right. David. And we sat together and said, you know, we can make a course out of this. Why don't we? And you can be my TA, even though he was only his third year. He's in his fourth year now. He's in his third year. And there were seniors sitting in the class. So he was junior to some of the people whom he was TA. But he's a crackerjack smart kid. They loved being challenged to think about what does a philosophical life mean? What is an examined life? What, you know, what was Socrates about as Plato presents it in the, in the dialogue? Um, so they, the, the, it was scintillating, the... Uh, questions, the discussion that went on within the class was really deeply rewarding. And I've gotten some uh, uh, tributes from students after the course who have written me saying best experience in uh, my educational career by far. Milton, Areopagitica, quote, give me the liberty to know, to utter, and to argue freely according to conscience above all liberties. The liberty to argue freely above all liberties. This what, is John what, are Milton, kids, what are the kids at Brown make of that? Paradise Lost. Well, you know, he's trying to inveigh against the idea that the Crown should license the printing of books. The printing press is 100 years old or so at the time he's writing. And uh, books are pretty dangerous things, you know. Um, and he's saying, look, it, uh, I don't want to live in a society in which political commissars decide what it is that I can read and what I can't read. There's freedom in those books. There's immortality, says Milton in that great essay in those books. You write a book that says something really important about life, you may die, but that book lives forever. As long as they don't ban the printing of the book. Mm -hmm. Keep your hands off my books. Václav Havel, Václav Havel, the yeah. dissident in Czechoslovakia, becomes president of Czechoslovakia after the communist regime falls. He writes a book called The Power of the Powerless. Quote, In everyone there is some willingness to merge with the anonymous crowd 
and to flow comfortably along down the river of pseudo life. So the kids read this and say, wait a minute, is Professor Lowry telling to tell us we're all accommodationist? No, they got it. They really did. And I love that essay by Havel and I love that particular quote. Um, they, so if your uh, audience doesn't know, Vaclav Havel was a playwright and became president of the Czech Republic, uh, was a dissident at the time that the Soviet Union was dominating political life in countries like Czechoslovakia. And he was a part of the underground Samizdat producing critique of the status quo. Um, and it was life or death. I mean, you could lose your livelihood, you could end up losing your freedom if you uh, spoke against the party. So it was a very closed, very cloistered uh, uh, system and people were being, you know, betrayed by their loved ones and things like this because they weren't adopting the party line. And he says, we're dying over here. These are my words, but this is what he's saying. We're living in unfreedom. And believe me, we are the ones who produce the system. Going along with it is making the system possible to work. We have a choice to make. Are we going to live or are we going to die? Are we going to embrace life or are we going to embrace what is in effect spiritual death? The power of the dissident comes in his or her relentless affirmation of life by standing for the truth come what may. And you know what? That's more powerful than those tanks at the end of the day. This is Václav Havel. And the kids loved it. They, they could see the kernel of the idea, which is that the truth teller is a very subversive and a very dangerous fellow. Glenn, one more from your syllabus. You entitle week number 12, The Case of Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas, Mr. Justice Thomas, Supreme Court Justice. And you assign for that session, Justice Thomas's memoir, My Grandfather's Son. Why? What do you hope for the students at this elite university to learn from his example? Uh, the very interesting question, Peter. I'm so glad you raised it because it's not necessarily what you would expect, which is these kids, you know, they're pro-choice and in terms of abortion and, right. you know, pro-gay rights and things like that. A conservative Catholic uh, long serving uh, jurist on the U.S. Supreme Court is an unlikely hero for them. My point was. Uh, you may agree or disagree with this or that opinion of the great Justice Clarence Thomas. Let me tell you about his life. Born off the coast of Georgia in one of those Sea Island situations where Geechee speaking and whatnot, dirt poor, scraped his way along, et cetera. You want a model of African-American heroism? You want an ideal of what it is that we should teach our kids to aspire to? I don't see how you could do any better than the life of Justice Thomas, but guess what? When the National Museum of African American History and Culture decided to stand up a museum, they didn't even have an acknowledgement of the existence of Clarence Thomas in it until people started complaining about that. And guess what? If you go to any liberal law school and you ask civil rights uh, professors who teach about civil rights law what they think about Justice Clarence Thomas, they'll say he's a sellout and he's an Uncle Tom. And you can't find in Hollywood, you can't find in the TV scripts, you can't find in the novels that are being produced by these publishing houses, any affirmation of the heroic character of this man's life. Why? He's a black conservative. He's off the reservation. He's thinking for himself. I had them. It's not on the syllabus. Look at the uh, film from that uh, testimony that Thomas gave at his uh, confirmation hearings, as I'm sure you're familiar with it, in which he very valiantly and powerfully affirms his right to think for himself. Just as Clarence Thomas was on my syllabus, because he thinks for himself. He's iconic representative of the cost you pay for thinking for yourself. And I wanted my kids to be able to look at his life in the whole, not filtered through what uh, the talking heads at MSNBC might have to say about him. Glenn, last question. <clears throat> you gave a lecture at Oxford that contained the following two sentences. First of all, let me repeat what I said at the beginning. You've traveled places, you've traveled intellectually, but you've also made a socioeconomic journey. You're in your 70s now. You do not look it and you do not act it, but you are. Thank you. And you have some wealth and a tenured position and kids clearly who love you. 
And here, is the, here are the two sentences that your Oxford lecture contained. I am a black intellectual and I must stand with my people. Why? Why not just... Re Glenn, you don't have anything to prove to anybody. You could just relax and enjoy yourself. Well, I guess it's my upbringing, you know, south side of Chicago, 1950s and the 1960s. As you said that, Peter, it reminded me of something that my uncle Alfred, now deceased, my mother's brother, a patriarch in our family. I, I loved him. He was a wonderful man in so many ways. And early in my flirtation with uh, uh, Reagan, uh, Reaganomics in the 80s, when I started moving right, uh, he pulled me aside and he said, son, we could only send one from the South Side to MIT and Harvard. We sent you. And we don't see us in anything you do. And it crushed me. I wanted him to see me as a furtherance of the river that's flowing along of our human uh, existence, of our culture, of our family, of our quote unquote people. I wanted to be seen as a black man making it in the world and making the world a better place for quote unquote his people. Now, in that very same essay, I acknowledge that when I say my people, the antecedent is, is ambiguous. I mean, my people, I'm an American, so my people are the American people, as well as the African American people. And maybe a hundred years from now, a man like myself with uh, the same kind of background of descent of Africans, wouldn't feel it so necessary to affirm as his people that subset of the American nation which is the African-American people. I expect that if you were of Irish descent or Italian descent or Jewish descent now, perhaps not so much the latter, but the, the need to affirm peoplehood in your ethnicity is less in 2021 than it was in 1921. I hope for the sake of our country that that'll be something that we can also say about blackness in 2121. But I don't think we're there yet with the jails overflowing and the et cetera, et cetera. And I just feel as a part of my own identity, um, a call of the tribe. And I'm not resisting it entirely. Professor Glenn Lowry, Woke Buster, <clears throat> thank you. My pleasure, Peter. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution and Fox Nation, thank you.